Welcome to the 139th Sustainability Salon. Um, we're going to be talking about hope and how you can get it and where you can find it and why you need it and what it can do for you and what you can do with it. And um, we're going to have three uh, speakers and then a panel. So folks on Zoom can welcome to the folks on Zoom, uh, our second hybrid salon. And uh, uh, so Susan, Kay Quinn is a environmental engineer by training, but is now a uh, speculative fiction writer specializing in uh, hope punk, solar punk, positive futures, not without challenges. And I can tell you from being introduced to Susan on Facebook by a mutual friend in Boston, um, who I did send the Zoom info to, but I don't think I've seen yet, um, out of the blue this morning. <laughs> uh, Susan has been popping up on my Facebook feed. Uh, every time I go into Facebook, there's Susan with some incisive, um, extremely intelligent commentary about stuff that's going on. So Susan is no Pollyanna. I can tell you that. I'm the people the the people in her books, at least the one I've read so far, um, meet with major challenges. Um, so it's all not all happy go lucky, but it's how you deal with the challenges and how you live your life um, that I think is presenting a different vision than a lot of stuff we see. So, um, uh, so yes, after Susan, we will have Diane Turncheck, who is a, a frequent salon attendee, but this time, unfortunately, she came down with COVID last week, uh, but fortunately, she got Paxlovid, which is great stuff, and is able to be with us on Zoom. Um, and uh, uh, following Susan will be a brief introduction by Scott Noel, who is a publisher and editor of a journal of this kind of thing, of speculative fiction that has a positive view and ways of dealing with the world that we can hopefully look forward to. Um, and then we'll have a panel with all three of them, one in person and two on Zoom. And uh, now I will say, take it away, Susan. Thanks for Thank being you, with us. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. It's an honor for me to be here. I'm excited. Um, what I'm going to do here is a little bit of uh, intro to me, the relevant background. Um, then I'm going to go and give you some context for why I do the work that I do. And then we're going to dive right in deep to a lot of the gritty details of what it means to write these kinds of stories and why they're important. So uh, me, I'm... I've got three engineering degrees, two in making the pollution and one in cleaning it up. Uh, I designed aircraft engines, uh, moved into low emissions aircraft engines, moved into now I need to do environmental engineering. Uh, worked at NCAR, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research for a little while, uh, doing global, global warming models, which is what we called it in the 90s. And loved that work, loved all of that work but ended up staying home with my kids for a while, ran for school board, did the political thing, uh, raised some kids. And when I was ready to come back to the working world, I realized that even though I'm a huge nerd, um, there was a whole creative side to me that was languishing and really needed expression. And so I sat down one day and started to write novels. And this is like in 2009. And it was like uncorking a very old bottle of champagne or maybe a very new bottle I don't know but it all came gushing out and I've been writing novels furiously ever since and um it is my passion it's my love in the last four or five years I hit a bit of a roadblock where the stories that I wanted to tell didn't work with all the sort of like I had learned how to be a professional writer I was making money I was a success and then the stories that I wanted to tell suddenly weren't lining up with the traditional 
tropes or uh, structure. Um, and I had to stop for a little bit and really retool and start to explore what, and I met a bunch of like-minded people who were looking into new mythos, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, and that's when my journey started to writing Hope Punk, Solar Punk. There's a dozen names we can call it. And we will also get to that. Um, and that's how I landed here with this beautiful four cover spread that my cover designer made uh, that I adore. Um, and these novels are my most recent novel series, Solar Punk. Um, they're closely together because they're, they're intimately entwined. They're following a structure where one protagonist hands the baton to the next protagonist and hands it to the next one because we're not going to solve this with one hero. We have to do this collectively. And telling stories about collective struggle is something that is not common <laughs> in literature. And it's not that it's not existent, okay, but it was unfamiliar to me and I had to do a lot of discovery. So that's how I ended up here talking about how hope is a plant that you can care for or kill. Um, let's talk a little bit about that word hope. What does hope have to do with it? Apologies to Tina Turner. Um, I believe that every, I've just, I haven't spoken to all of you, but I believe that most of you here want to see progress on fighting the climate crisis. Otherwise you'd not be in a sustainability salon. What drives that, I believe, is what is our narrative about the climate? How do we understand what is going on with the climate? And both individually and publicly, action depends on whether what your understanding is. If you don't think it exists, you're not gonna do anything. If you think it's a doom, you're not gonna do anything. If you think it's like manageable and you have just one thing you have to do, you're gonna do that, but pay no more. So there's a lot of passive uh, people out there. And there's a lot of passive in the, the government institutions where we're gonna meet every year or every two years or whatever and have a big conference, but like, are we actually making progress? And I think we all collectively wanna see that move from passive to active. And I think there are a lot of things that influence the, the narrative, what people actually believe about the climate. You got the scientists who have been working like crazy forever, trying to convince us with the facts. You've got activists who are putting their lives on hold to go be an activist for climate change, against climate change. Those people are doing fantastic work. I used to be one of them. And in some ways, a bit of each of these still. Um, those are not enough though. And I think we've kind of acknowledged that. We've kind of gotten to the point where we're realizing that just telling people the facts is not enough. Just gluing your hand to a statue is actually not enough. Uh, it's not that it's not vital. I think it's necessary. I just don't think it's sufficient. I think there's more that we need. Nonfiction has come to the rescue a bit. We're talking uh, Finding the Mother Tree by Susan Samard. It's a beautiful analogy that she birthed with her scientific research, but she turned it into a nonfiction book that was reaching the populace and able to really ignite the imagination. A lot of filmmaking comes in this category. You're seeing, especially in the last 10 years, you're seeing a lot of documentaries about people who are experiencing environmental racism or you know, aftermath of uh, a hurricane or building a microgrid in Malaysia. All these different people, their stories are starting to come out and a lot of that's coming out through nonfiction. In a way, that's bridging between science and activism and connecting it to the public, All right? So fantastic work, still not enough. <laughs> then reality came along and smacked everybody in the face. And I'm talking now in the last, say, five years, seven years, where climate change has noticeably become an everyday news item, and tragically so, and relentlessly so. And I think that even though these other pieces laid the foundation, reality is what moved the needle and really changed the narrative for a lot of people. 
at the same time, you've got bad actors in there who are trying to flip the narrative back to no matter what, don't do anything. Be passive, stay in your passive state, which everybody seems to want to do anyway. Not everybody, I'm being facetious. But that's a countervailing force. But there's a missing piece here, and that's fiction. And that is my wheelhouse, okay? Now the problem with fiction has been for 20 plus years is we're only telling the despair part of that story. We are trying, we collectively, literary folk, have been trying to tell the disaster story. Things go terribly wrong and the environmental disaster ensues. And so it's trying to, it's taking the classic dystopia approach of we're trying to warn you, people, we're trying to warn you, this is real, this is going to happen, do something. And people are like, oh, that's interesting, that's a fun movie. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what we've come to discover is that those negative stories, those dystopias, those apocalyptic stories are doing the exact opposite. <laughs> didn't get you going, as the activism didn't get you going. The fictional story that happens a hundred years in the future that doesn't bear any relationship to my life uh, is not gonna move you. And, and so, you know, again, that didn't really help until reality came along, smacked people in the face and got some more people concerned but still passive, and there's a gap there. So what this whole talk is gonna be about is the top piece, hope. So what I mean by hope is how do you tell a story that's not just warning people how terrible it's gonna be, but actually shining a light on the pathway forward saying, this is how you fix it. This is what it looks like. This is what it tastes like. This is what it feels like when you're working in community to heal your community and to recognize that we're all interconnected. And these are the tools that you're going to need in order to do this really complicated thing. Because these bad actors like to come along and tell you this is a simple problem, you can just ignore it, or it's too late. And it's not a simple problem at all. It's a very deeply complicated problem. And one thing that fiction, is really good at is deeply complicated problems because we embody it in a character that you care about and you see that character struggle with real questions about their life and you can get into the complexity of those decisions and hopefully inspire people all right oops what did i do okay let's talk about that four letter word hope so sometimes when I say, start talking about hope, um, people have a very negative reaction to that. Um, they actually get pissed. And that took me aback at first. I'm like, it's like being mad at puppies. What, what are you even doing here? And what I found was that we weren't really talking about the same thing. So I'm going to start with two quotes, and then I'm going to get into some definitions to help us understand what we're actually talking about before we move into how do we use this tool. So the first quote is, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. This is Václav Havel, Czech dissident, writer, and statesman and activist uh, who knew a little bit about resisting power <laughs> and fomenting revolution. The conviction that something is worth doing, okay? So what he's talking about is what I'll call sustaining hope. And we'll get to that in a minute, but I want you to remember that term. And then Rebecca Solnit, who, if you have not read her works, she's an amazing visionary in this field, specifically the, the hopeful, need for hopeful narratives. She says, despair is a black leather jacket that everyone looks good in. Hope is a frilly pink dress that exposes the knees. <laughs> and it's so true. I have been wearing that frilly pink dress and I can tell you it makes you vulnerable. It exposes your knees to criticism and everybody wants to be, you know, the race to the bottom of despair. 
How bad is it? Let me tell you. I can top that. It's even worse than you think. Nope. Total annihilation. <laughs> you know, like, there's, it's very easy to do that. It's very seductive to fall into that narrative. Hope makes us vulnerable, makes us not want to, like, be proven wrong, which is so easy to have happen, because just open up, you know, your news app, and there it is. Um, but it's very important to have that vulnerability. And in fact, I would say that's a critical piece of this. Having the vulnerability, the courage to be vulnerable, to allow other people to be vulnerable, that's actually part of how we heal, how we get through all of this. So those are my two guiding things. Now I'm going to talk about the four kinds of hope. I lucked into this um, climate conference that I was attending and Jasmine Kirkbride, who's a PhD student, did a presentation on these four kinds of hope. And she was examining the roles that hope plays in fiction and in climate activism. The first two are passive forms of hope. And the second two are active. So hope as a deceiver is the first one, wishful thinking, false hope. This is that Pollyanna stuff. Everything's going to be glitter and fine. Uh, hope is an object. This is the best we can hope for. It's it's something out there. Just be optimistic that everything will work out. Um, both of those are essentially passive and allow the person to step back and say, that is, I don't have to do anything because it's either going to work out or it's already fine. The two parts, uh, the two kinds of hope that we really need to embrace, I feel, to really get through this crisis is hope is a sustainer. So that means we're keeping hope alive despite the depressing reality. Like, I don't know about you, but the reality is depressing. Uh, if you're paying attention, you're gonna be a little bit depressed. Um, and we need something, some call it grit, call it faith, call it hope. I don't really care what you call it, but that thing that keeps you going. Because as Pavel said, it's the right thing to do. Even if it you don't, nobody has any guarantees for any of that. That it'll work, it'll solve something, what it'll do. We don't have guarantees. So we need hope as a sustainer. We also need hope as a catalyst. And that's when you get into some specifics. You have individual and communal action, realistic hope. This is where you can see the end goal. You can see the pathway. And, oh, hello. Is your battery? Oh gosh, it might be. Um, Oh. The Zoom audience can still see the screen. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. I can speak to this, but oh, it would be unfortunate. Let me see if I can. <laughs> no, my battery is fine. We Let me run the HDMI out of my laptop. What happened? By turning off the monitor and turning it back on. Give me that. Oh, uh, I'll run the out HDMI of out of it. Here, it's out of this one. I'll run that one. Too. Sorry, folks. I don't really can't see much here, but. Do we have a. <laughs> that feels like, you know, an optimistic cup to me. It is a very passive. It's going to get, it's going to get better. Somebody's going to do it. Um. Do we have a second HDMI cable? There we go. Can you see it now? We do. There's a nope. round somewhere. So it's like really faded. On these small screens, we can see it. What's the, what do you see? It's like a dim. You can barely see it back there. Oh, oh, the backlighting is on. Okay. Let me try to turn it off and on again. It might not have been. Yeah, yours is fine. Yeah, it wasn't mine. I still have battery. Nerves. Okay, okay, great. Okay, two minutes to be clear. Can I see this? 
That seems unlikely, but there you go. There we go. Let's we'll right, plug it back into yours. Let's plug it back into yours so you're, you're driving. Okay. Oh, Hi. Come on in. Take the freebies. There's no signal now. Yeah, because we're, we're transitioning here. Yeah, right. This way I can still do the Zoom helmet. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm. Okay, it's not. Oh. Why is it not showing this? It's not showing. Okay, I got it. Technical difficulties as we zoom through the things that we've already talked about. Act as Hope, I highly recommend yes. this book. Uh, it talks a lot about strategies to deal with this and keep going. Um, all right. So we got these four different kinds of hope. Why do we want to turn that into stories? What is stories going to help us with? Well, let's first ask the negative question. Why not more dystopia? Why not more apocalypse? Um, we got things like Day After Tomorrow and Snowpiercer. I don't know if you've seen that, but Jesus. Um, Children of Men, not much better. Um, there's an undertone of these stories that we deserved it. And, you know, the whole of humanity gets wiped out except for a small group of people who will carry on and usually led by a man with an axe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and his success really hinges on how much violence he's willing to do. Okay? I'm sorry. That's not any better. Just leave me frozen by the, you know, Statue of Liberty, please. Uh, which is actually probably where I will end up. <laughs> um, so why not more of this? Well, these feed into the five stages of climate denial, which are probably very familiar to you. Deny the problem exists. Deny we're the cause. Deny the problem. Deny we can solve it, which has many subparts. It's too costly. We can solve it later. Delay is the new deny. Uh, or let's use pretend solutions. This is my new favorite where Shell is like, oh yeah, we're a green company now. They're like, get the fuck out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then number five, it's too late. We didn't do anything and now it's too late to do anything, which has in common doing nothing at any point along the way. So these narratives, only speak in these narratives, feed into that denialism, and tells us you don't have to take any action until the apocalypse happens, and then a hero will come to save you. All right? All of that needs to go away. All right, so let's talk about what the alternative to that is. Why we need hopeful stories that are of the sustainer and catalyst kind. First of all, I don't know if you guys have seen the Tomorrowland, um, it's a great undersold movie. I would absolutely go watch it because it is very much what my talk is about. In the story, just brief recap, they've invented a machine that predicts the future and it knows with 100% certainty that we are doomed. And so everything just starts to fall apart. And they're like, what do we do? We're doomed. So of course it's going to fall apart. And of course our young spunky protagonist comes along and says, um... Aren't I supposed to have like a future or something? Like, I don't, I don't agree. I do not consent to this. And that bumps it down to like 99.99. All right. So I totally spoiled the movie for you. Still worth watching. <laughs> um, so these people are stuck in a doom loop. These people have no relationship to us. <laughs> okay. We are stuck in doom loop. We are stuck because our narratives have told us endlessly that the apocalypse is going to come. And now it's at our doorstep. All you got to do is see the smoke coming down from Canada. And, you know, people are like posting pictures of the New York skyline with like Blade Runner 2049. And okay, yes, we need to get out of the doom loop. There's nothing more certain than pessimism and optimism. Those are both coins of the same thing that I am certain I know how this is going to go. And if there's one thing I can guarantee everybody here, you do not know how this is going to go. I do not know how this is going to go. I do know that we are here to write that future. Everything that we do informs that future, collectively and individually. 
At the same time, we need to acknowledge grief, anxiety, all the feels, because it's a lot to deal with this world. All right. And part of what healing is, is acknowledging your grief and working through your grief and getting past that to the point where you can take action again. This is all about how do you get from that passive to that active point. Um, I have here teach how rather than how not. So dystopias teach us how not. Say, so don't do this, don't do that. If you're teaching a kid how to tie their shoelaces, you can't teach them how to not tie their shoelaces. You have to teach them how to tie the shoelaces a hundred times across three children. I have experience in this. And it, we don't do that in our fiction, which is perfectly suited for it because it is a forward-looking genre, at least for science fiction. It says, this is what it will be in the future. Here's how you get there. And some of them skip way over and go like, you know, 2200. I'm focused much more on the near fiction or near future fiction where we're a little bit further down the path and we're still struggling, but these are the struggles we're encountering and this is how we work through them. I have Dr. Elizabeth Swain um, and her tweet here says, signs of collapse and signs of ecological society emerging coexist right now. The news covers the scary parts, which we need to know, and we can't look away. But let's not miss the little shoots of a saner, more connected, ecologically, socially, economic system either. What hint of a life-sustaining society do you see emerging right now? She's practicing hope punk right there. She's asking people, tell me where you see people doing the how to get to where we need to go. Because it does coexist with all the terrible stuff. And we tend to be binary in everything so relentlessly, not just gender, <laughs> okay? Not just, I don't know, political parties. We, we want a yes or no. We want the simple answer. We don't want to have yes and no at the same time. Uh, but the world is very complex. It is not a simple solution to this. And so we need to have some acknowledgement that that's going to continue to occur. Even when things actually reach a pretty good state, we're still gonna have bad things happening. So if we can't tolerate that, if we can't learn to live in a world and keep going in a world that is not perfect, we're gonna have big problems. Um, I'm also gonna return to this, people are not a monolith later. But um, as I was saying earlier to one of our salon people, um, you know, there's the 15% who will always do the right thing no matter what and no matter who's looking. And there's the 15% that will try to con you no matter what until they're stopped. And then there's the middle 70% that kind of go with the wind and whoever's in charge. And it's very, I'm in that 15% who's like, I'm determined and I have all my morals and I'm driven by that. And God, I can't even stand it when like things are even slightly not moral. That's my thing. And that's great. We need people like that, but that is not everybody. There are a lot of people who are much more concerned about their bowling league or their kids or legitimately like just having food. So we need to meet people where they are and fiction has a great capacity to do that. I have no idea how I'm doing on time, so I'm just gonna keep going there. Somebody give me a heads up if I get excessive. Um, we are great. We're no fault of your own. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we are. All right. So um, I will do what's most important. How's that? Or do you need to cut me off at a certain point? Okay. You are a chance. Okay. So what do these stories look like? What do hopeful stories look like? I have this. Um, the title for this talk came from a Tumblr poem. I love this because it was collaboratively made. Somebody made a post about hope. They said, hope is a discipline. And people were like, yes, it is. And they kept piling on to it. And then somebody somewhere along the way said, this is a Dr. Seuss poem. I'm going to write that. And they did. And it's amazing. And then, of course, somebody had to come along and illustrate it with Dr. Seuss things. So that link, you know, if you get a chance, all my slides will be on my website. So you can click through the link later. 
read the whole thing. It's a delight. But it encapsulates how this works collectively. Um, and I'm just going to read it real fast. I was really expecting this to turn into a poem like, hope is a weapon. Hope is a skill. Hope is a plant you can care for or kill. Hope is a discipline, something you choose. Hard to stop looking for, easy to lose. Hope isn't something to have or to take. If you can't find it, it's something you make. Make it from willpower, make it from spite. Learn how to weaponize love in a fight. Hope is a shield and a thing to defend. In the end in itself and a means to an end, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, maybe one of these tags is in a familiar meter and it subconsciously activated a dormant democracy's love on my brain. Classic Tumblr, gotta finish that off with some crazy madness. <laughs> I love this because it's, it's telling us that hope has a lot of complexity to it. And we need to embrace that, but it's also collaborative creation, which is also, yeah, sorry. Okay, so what do these stories look like off of Tumblr? <laughs> All right. Um, Star Trek, Strange New Worlds, the captain is his superpower is compassion. If you've seen it, you know what I mean. If you don't, it's unlike any Star Trek you've seen. It's fantastic. Um, Song for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers is a novel series to duo uh, called the Monk and Robot series. One of Hugo. All about sustainably, sustainability. Lots of gentle vibes in this one. Um, Ministry for the Future, Kim Stanley Robinson, our hero of utopic novels. Uh, he's, he's like, yeah, no, I'm just going to sit down and write the solution to this problem in a novel form with 50 protagonists. And I'm like, you go, Stan. Um, and then The Last of Us, which doesn't seem like it belongs, like which one doesn't belong in this list? The Last of Us is a post-apocalyptic zombie horror TV series. However, it subverts the classic zombie trope of the person who wins in that environment is the guy with the biggest gun who machetes the most zombies, right? Here in The Last of Us, cooperation, the people who are most cooperative are the ones who survive. And it's beautiful, like, inversion of that trope. So this is like a five out of 10 hopeful story. These are more like 10 out of 10. Um, but that's really significant because it's bleeding into mainstream media. And there's a reason for that. So um, there's a lot of words on here, but I'm sorry about that. This is me diving deep into the 10 elements of hope punk that I identified as I was struggling to write my stories. Wait, how does somebody hear? He's like, so I'm gonna quickly go through these, um, but I think you'll get the idea of why these are elements of stories that could be seen as hopeful, as opposed to what we normally see all the time in art fiction. Weaponized optimism, not doomerism. Radical compassion instead of brutality. Think about Doctor Who, who solves everything with compassion and a screwdriver, versus like every other story where they solve it with their fists, okay? Communalism, not the lone hero. The idea of having collectives who fight together as opposed to the chosen one who's going to be your hero. Cooperation rather than combat. Interdependence rather than radical individuality. And all of those kind of come together in the heroine's journey versus the hero's journey. Now, those are not gendered terms. Uh, Wonder Woman is a hero. Harry Potter is a heroine. It's a type of plot. So the hero's journey is very classic. Joseph Campbell dominates everywhere. You can't trip over a story without saying, like, that's the hero's journey. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. The hero's journey I'm referring to is specifically Gail Carriger's four, where it's much more about building society. It's your protagonist has a break with their family that's not due to their own, you know, being an asshole. It's like somebody died and they have to go through a journey to build allies and friends and networks to basically rebuild their lives. And in the process, they build civilization. It's a fundamentally different story than a lot of our heroic novels. 
All right, moving on. Number seven, anti-dystopian, not the dystopia and apocalypse. Um, restorative justice rather than revenge. This is a particularly important one to me. Restorative justice says we all need to be okay in the end. Even the people who have done great harms, maybe in the end we just have to protect society from them. Maybe they are not, it's not possible to do restorative justice. But in a lot of cases there is. And when you do that, you build community, you build those bonds. Or you could go out and get your revenge fantasy. And that's oh, fundamentally destructive to society. Um, I think it kind of comes together in number nine, befriend the dragon and change the status quo, rather than slay the dragon and return to the status quo. Usually dragon comes in, dragon's the bad guy. We got to kill him and then justice is restored. Well, the status quo is restored. And probably the status quo kind of sucked to begin with, especially for the dragon. So why are we slaying the dragon? <laughs> and that's just a given. Perhaps there's another way. Um, and then 10, gentle vibes, healing, sustainability rather than violence. That's the one that I feel like people struggle with the most. Violence is just drenched in all of our storytelling. So that's a tough one. But all of this comes down to, in my mind, Hope Punk this idea of hope punk and don't get too hung up on the term because again it has many names um it's a threat to the status quo brutality of our world we are rejecting that status quo brutality and saying there has to be a better way and it has many of these elements to it so i'm going to talk briefly about hope punk as a phenomenon and not a subgenre as I said with The Last of Us, it's leaking into all of these other mainstream stories. It's not just happening in literature. It's not just happening in film. It's not just happening in fiction. And in fact, one of the first glimmers I got of this was when wholesome memes became a thing for my kid. Now, when I was a kid, and most of my adult life, wholesome was a pretty pejorative term. It was right up there with Pollyanna. And my kids are like reclaiming that term. They're like, no, no, we we like wholesome things that are just good for being good. And like this meme, I just saw on Reddit a post by someone with extreme anxiety asking how to order a sandwich at Subway because I never tried it. And someone replied and wrote out his step-by-step -step instruction without being snarky or judgmental. And it's the kindest, sweetest thing I've seen in months. Those are values that our whole thing, <laughs> but it's also the solution. If we had a world where that was common, if we saw that world demonstrated in fiction as a template for living, we're going to want to have more of that. We hunger for this kind of thing. All right, I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but these are a bunch of the names that people call hope punk. They call it solar punk. They call it hopeful sci-fi, new mythos, sweet, sweet weird. Um, it's everywhere. All right. It's everywhere, and we're challenging the status quo brutality. These are just some fun memes that I'm going to skip over because we're short on time. Um, but the one on the bottom is me commenting at a climate conference where I was saying, hey, being cozy, gentle, and healing is radical and disruptive. Like, I know you guys think that that's, like, soft, but let me tell you. If you start having everyone rest as much as they need to rest, you know what's going to happen? Everything's going to fall apart. <laughs> and that's pretty radical and disruptive in my world. Um, when we start centering people in their healing, oh my gosh, stuff really happens. So I feel strongly about the punk part of that. Where can you find these hopeful stories? Truth be told, they're scarce. It's hard to find. We're butting up against that tradition of People don't even know how to write these stories. People like myself, professional writers, stalled out going, I, I don't have any guidelines for how to write this kind of story. I had to invent that in my own. And I wrote that whole series. First one, when you have power, one of the elements of that that I feel strongly about is like the formation of families. So found families, common trope in a lot of fiction, I wanted to take it one step further and say, okay, we've gone far enough down the road of acknowledging that found families are, are very justified and adequate and wonderful. We're going to legalize that. We're going to let people like sign contracts to enter into all kinds of family structures. 
And so I play with that in my series. Like, what does that mean? If you have a family, like if you have a normalized legal structure, it's just one of the many subplots in there, but I'm trying to demonstrate a future where things look different, shining the light on that, that path of like, hey, here's one option that we could pursue. So other places you'll find stories like this. I have a, a recommendation list on my website, Dreamforge Magazine. Uh, has hopeful stories. Scott Noel will be on our panel here shortly. Uh, Solar Punk Magazine has a lot. Android Press is doing great work. Imagine 22, you uh, might know Grist, is an environmental journalism site. They sponsor hopeful fiction stories. Serena Ulbari just had a novel come out. But we're running up against a lot of the gatekeepers. Serena published through a small press. I'm self-published. A lot of these zines are small undertakings. So it's happening at this level. But when you try to bang on the gates and get up into the the you know large publishers, they're like, Well, is that even a story? Where's the hero? I thought but send me an apocalypse and we'll talk. Well, yeah, okay, never mind. But people are sneaking it into film, which is amazing. Now remember how I said like five out of ten. All right, not 100%, but getting there, free guy, a lot of hope punk, a lot of like literally building a world collectively. Uh, Strange World is actually solar punk. It's got ecological themes in there. Star Trek Discovery, mostly season three and on. It's like they just, they tried some like regular pow pow stuff and then they woke up and said, hey, there's this new hope punk thing let me rummage around in that bin and pull out some pieces and now we got a cooperative storyline and some compassion and it was fantastic to watch and then station 11 actually is a post-apocalyptic story but the tagline says survival is insufficient and i think that's what it comes down to is like we need to do better than survive and that's actually the key <clears throat> all right i'm currently working on a screenplay that is about climate fiction near future in Houston, because you might as well go to the belly of the beast and right there. Um, the NRDC is sponsoring a climate screenwriting fellowship that I'm going to be applying for. And there's an institute called Climate uh, Hollywood Climate Summit. All of these people are trying. They're trying to move the narrative on the screen to show the climate in a bunch of different ways on the screen because of the CSI effect. So the CSI effect refers to a couple of different things. The one I'm referring to is where CSI got really popular. And before that popularity, women were very underrepresented in uh, the mortician arts and investigative, you know, whatever you call those, you know, using fingerprints to find the clues and everything, that sort of field, very underrepresented. But we had these cool, sexy, fun ladies that were in the lab doing that work. And in the years after that, enrollment boomed. Women who saw that on the screen said, hey, maybe I'll try that. And so TV can, TV and movies can have a really strong effect. People in Hollywood know that, all right? Especially the writers know that. And so there are a lot of people who are trying to push this forward to say, hey, we can get more climate depiction on the screen where we see real people battling, like how do I connect my personal struggles with the climate struggle? What does that look like? What, is it, what does it look like to be an activist? What does that even mean? And really like educate people about that. It can have a hugely formative effect and move the needle. So that's what I'm working on right now. Again, people are not a monolith. This graph is the difference between passive and active. So this is saying that this number is like 60, 70% of people believe that climate should be a top priority to ensure a sustainable planet. But only 20, 30% of them think it's their top personal concern. And about that same number have done actually something personally in the last year. So there's this gap, right? Actually, if you, if you decide it's a top personal concern, you're actually pretty likely to do something about it. There's no gap here. The gap is between the passive and the active. You go from, yeah, yeah, that's important, to that's my most important thing. And now I got to do something about it. Media can make that move. And 
I, you know, things like this headline, Hawaii wildfires stoke climate denial and conspiracy theories. Yeah. Like, I don't know how someone looks at a hundred people dead, hundreds missing, devastation and says, oh, climate denial is definitely in order. People do because they're not a monolith, because some people just literally cannot deal. And so they go shift immediate. And so the worse it gets, the more they're going to go into denial until we start to see things where it's just not cool. It's just not okay to be in denial that much. Like then you start to be out on the fringes of society. Then you start to be like a genuine lunatic. Um, you know, social pressure is huge. Mass media has impact. So we don't have to have all of these people and these people will definitely make headlines. There's not a ton of them, okay? And they aren't necessarily where we need to spend all of our energy. I'd rather see us going from, you know, people who already think that that 70% that already think it's a top concern. Let's shift that to being something you can be active in. Let's help you see the embodiment of what that looks like. And fiction is a great tool for doing that. So what does hope have to do with it? All of these things are super important for moving that climate narrative. But I'm sorry, fellow fiction writers, we've been falling down on the job. We have not been writing the kind of stories that can help us move that needle. Give people examples. Give them heroes that they fall in love with, characters they just love to hate. You know, that's what we do. That's, that's what we're good at, is spinning narratives of the future. We should be harnessing that to build a future where we can survive and not after the apocalypse, like right now and 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And a final thought from Ursula K. Le Guin, who is my absolute hero. The exercise of imagination is dangerous to those who profit from the way things are because it has the power to show that the way things are is not permanent, not universal, and not necessary. Thank you for your attention. Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. And now you can uh, relax. Relax? Can I sit here? Is it okay? You can okay. if you like, or you could sit there and anywhere is mm -hmm. fine. Um, there are some cushions for the steps behind Chris mm -hmm. under a chair up there. Um, and now I think uh, we will uh, not do any Q&A right now. Um, we're going to try to power through and bring, now we need this to be plugged in over there. Um, to bring Diane onto the screen she's there i believe she can hear us right now oh there we are that's definitely a diane picture um and uh uh diane turncheck is an astronomer and an educator um uh runs a lecture series in at the allegheny observatory which is how i met her because neil was giving a talk there on climate and um uh, thank you for the scone break, Greg. These are great. Greg always brings scones and they're awesome. Um, and uh, uh, she's also a dark sky advocate. She's also an environmentalist. She has a little 500 square foot tiny house um, that is built not just small, but very greenly. And um, here in Pittsburgh. And uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, uh, let's see. Yes, Mark is getting Diane onto. Here we are and getting Diane spotlighted, probably. Yep, working on it. Okay. There she is. Okay. And thank you so much, Diane, for being here despite a case of COVID. So, uh, and thank you to whoever developed Paxil Paxlovid because it helped Diane be with us today. I, she was a lot more miserable just a few days ago. So thank you and I'll take it away, Diane. Hey, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. 
<clears throat> I just want to say a few things about myself, why I'm an astronomer, and I am so passionate about climate disasters and catastrophes. Um, I started wanting to be an astronomer when I was seven. And then after college and grad school, I started having kids. And I love my four boys who all live in Pittsburgh very much, but it took me right out of the running for being an astronomer. It wasn't until they were old enough to be more on their own that I started working again. And that's what led me to writing while I was home with them, writing the things I knew, science, science fiction. And so the, uh, the thing that I do now that I'm back is a little, I thought it was going to be a little less technical. I turned to changing the world to make it a darker place. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of different things going on here. Um, Susan did a wonderful job of um, taking over a lot of stuff that I don't need to say now, yay. Um, the definitions of these things, hope punk, this optimism, gentleness, kindness, she really did an excellent job of explaining that. Some people get solar punk, ego punk, bio punk, they get them all mixed up together but they each have their own very specific uh, little niche. But the main thing is exactly what she was saying is that um, we need to do a better job of writing hopeful fiction. Um, these are places you can find it. I'm part of the Climate Fiction Writers League, a lot of writers all around the world. Well, then the Utopia Awards just got announced by Locust, and that's the best of the hopeful fiction that you can, you know, you can read and, and vote on. Um, humans tell stories. That's what they do. I'm just going to stop sharing for a sec. Um, you know, humans tell stories, and it's a way to get our point across, but it's also teaching and in memorable ways that can change your your ideas about a subject. So if you have a very um, sympathetic character and they're going through a lot of troubles, you form an emotional attachment if the story is written well. You get in close in their head. You're going through what they're going through. You're, you're in contact with their thought processes and so you got you gather empathy for them and it makes climate change feel real and that is actionable that's what that's what susan was saying it's it's just it impacts your personal choices when you read something that you get really involved with it conjures up these emotional responses tell stories right a group of humans who did tell stories well which one of them survived it is a survival skill it is survival of the fittest if you tell stories then this is helpful for building community and and uh, transferring your understanding and knowledge about something so we, we use it we use it to storify our own lives to make sense out of our own lives right because <laughs> you're you are your own story and you got to make your own story. That's part of part of life. Um, through Topia, though, is something that I just wanted to touch on. This is a concept by a philosopher. He's at the University of East Anglia, Rupert Reed. I don't know if you've heard of him, but how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? Those are the stories we need to tell. You know, it's all well and good to tell a story of some wonderful utopia but until we read the how do we get there and have things laid out for us it's it's not as helpful those kind of stories are not as helpful so we look deep into this climate crisis and you get 
ego anxiety and you get despair, fear, heartache. And those are all rational emotions, unfortunately. You know, those are emotions arising out of love for others and, and the earth. So our sadness and our anger, that's what energizes us, that crystallizes into action. That's what we need. So we do need the stories to tell the truth, to put it out there. It's not an easy truth, but that helps us sometimes find purpose, find meaning in life, because there are people who just want to be remembered as an ancestor who changed the path of the world. Right? <laughs> Do you want to be that person? It's, it's something that empathy with the characters leads you to think you can be a better person. And I, I really think hopeful fiction does this. Um, so a little aside, I've been working at the Entertainment Technology Center. I'm at Pitt and at CMU in the physics departments. And the Entertainment Technology Center at CMU in the spring, they did a VR game with me where you put on the VR helmet and you were a bird coming over Mount Washington in a flock on your way to migrating somewhere. But then you got distracted because you saw the bright lights of the city and you get sucked into the city and disrupted by the lights and you crash and you die. That's the end of the game. It was a very specific game made for games of change in New York City. But that was it. It was a Kobe Marash, Kobayashi Maru. It was you die. That was the end. You always die. <laughs> so um, I'm working with them now again. And this time what I'm doing is um, climate change. I have spring and fall six grad students in the spring and six in the fall and it's another vr game where you are in the mind of an animal who is going through their normal life and then the climate disruption comes into play and it's, so it's that same anxiety that you feel but it's the empathy for the cute little animal like i think our first one's a shark um, and then you get to um see how they deal with the problems and hoping that changes people's minds. So, all right, back to slides for a little. This one or that one. Interesting, there's two choices here. All right, that works. Um, so biophilic ideas, it's, a, it, we're going to put that setting as a character thing for some of our fiction. We just have to show the way, show what it could be like, how we get there. No monoculture, flat grass lawns. You got complex things, intense, touchable greenery lots of streets, walkable parks, people who live in houses, but they're drenched in sunlight from lots of directions and access to open water, not just to see it sometimes, but sometimes to hear it too. Living plants, other people. And I, I think it's an idea that is just welling up all over. I see it in so many places. This is apartment therapy. All right, I like interior decorating. Saving the world one room at a time, that's their tagline. But they found that natural materials and biophilic interior trends are just so on the rise, the last couple years actually, because being connected to nature, it's important to people. You gotta feel that that grounding, that, that peace in your own home, curved organic lines, they're described as perfectly imperfect and warm materials, um, a lot of heavy fabrics, wall hangings that are florals and grasses and meadows and natural, bringing nature in. I just, I just think it's very beautiful. And I've tried to follow that in my house. This is a picture of my house. Uh, I've got a climbing wall tree up to a loft <laughs> ceiling. 
And I've got a lot of woods in here. I've got teak and reclaimed barnwood pine. And this is live edge cherry on my bar top. Cedar ceilings, bamboo floors, like huge, huge windows looking outside. That's a Murphy bed that you're seeing there. This is just a quick teaser. But Tim B Bately, he is a man when it comes to biophilic cities, and you can go to this work, he's shown there are scientific evidence for all of these things. When you introduce biophilia into our city, if you show people the way to take this built environment, just concrete and glass and soften it, bring nature into the city, you can find the kind of life that you would like to see in a city. I'm not going to read all these, but you can. And I will say that the more biophilic a city is, the more resilient it is, right? Rain gardens, you know what those are, right? Uh, turn around and look, Baron has one. <laughs> Um, they take care of stormwater flooding, water runoff, um, add extra surface water so you're fighting drought, and it, and it combats the heat island effect, the more greenery and water you have on the surface. And the same with green rooftops, park plazas. As long as you're coexisting with nature, you get these benefits, all of these benefits. So we need to show people how that's done in our fiction. I went up to Banff. Okay, so all those plane rides. <laughs> Sad, but Banff was great with the glaciers. They have these paths for the animals that are just like uh, roadways. They're as wide as a roadway over the road, and it's only trees and plants, and you get to see them. I just took one picture from the inside of the bus, but as we went closer and closer to the mountains, you saw that they were completed. They completed 35 of them and 60% reduction in vehicular accidents. Like that's amazing. And then they would paint on the sides or, or draw on the sides of all these um, underpasses, beautiful mountains or you know fun stuff that brought nature to you as a picture. And that is also surprisingly something that helps in interior design and building design is not only actual nature, but uh, scroll work and, and fractals and things that remind you of nature also make you grounded. Here in Pittsburgh, we're doing a lot of this, greening up empty lots. We've got urban planning going on in many places, like putting in where the water will not just run off, but swales, riprap and... Um, Lots of groups are doing sidewalk and flower gardens, urban farming. We know we have chickens and ducks in the city and donkeys. Um, greenways, uh, Hazelwood is a master at that. If you know where Hazelwood is down by the Mon River, uh, they've planted so many trees on the slopes there that they got a UN award for it this year. And bringing wildlife back into the cities making it safe for them to be in the cities and safe for the people, but bringing the wildlife back in, it makes a big difference to how you feel in your city. Um, so Pittsburgh itself has 42% tree canopy coverage, 800 connections to nature in the form of the city steps, 3,600 acres, over 165 parks, um, let me just go back one second. No, I'm gonna stop sharing again. I'm gonna keep doing this. Because <laughs> I wanna show you this. So triangulation. When I was home with the boys, I said, oh, I'm gonna be an anthology editor because I've never done that before and it might make my writing better. And it did, that was in 2003. And the series has continued almost every year since then. So. Triangulation Dark Skies was about light pollution. Combined some of my loves. You know, Peter Pan comes down to earth. He gathers up the lost boys. He's looking for the second star to the right, straight on till morning. He can't find it, of course, because of light pollution. <laughs> so, But this is science fiction, fantasy, and horror stories about 
So the next one, edited it with a Pitt student, um, extinction, about you know, species extinction. The problem is when we were getting submissions for these, I didn't feel like we got the right ones. I was looking for hopeful solutions and we got so many disastrous, like, oh, they're all horrible. Next one was habitats, because I love my sustainable little tiny house. Um, so I was trying to explain to people how there are many ways to build a house, show people, um, you know, other ways to live, not in McMansions. We keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger houses with less and less and less people living in them every year. And you don't need that. So habitats was uh, my my key to that. So many stories missed the entire point. They were just about tree houses, but you get you get what you you get what you get. Alternative energy. I didn't edit this one. I was um, editor emeritus for this one. So alternative energy. This one, fantastic. All kinds of alternative energy. That's John Thompson and Storm Walden, and uh, energy. What else did I get? Um, this one. So this is this is a tough one. This is automation. It's going to float all the boats because the rising tide lifts all the ships, right? So if we automate things, then it should become easier for people. And let's see it in story form. But this one, edited by Greg Klumpner, this one was a like Robots stole my crappy ass job and I want it back. And so I'm going to be violent and div. I was like, I, I can't accept those. <laughs> You're missing the entire point of being hopeful here. Um, so we're, we're on to the next one. It has two new editors. And every time we change editors, and we've had like 14 editors so far, they get better at writing. Because if you read through all place for people to um, have actionable things happening. Um, we're going to go back to share. And now we can go to that one slide. This one. Um, so what I find is that space is our shared ancestor. It's part of the environment. It is not being considered part of the environment by environmental groups, but I'm telling you it is. <laughs> it belongs to all of us, impacts all of humanity and, and the, all the ecological systems. And they, they evolved to depend on the sky. A lot of them use the stars. So we have a duty to consult all the people making changes that affect others. And here are some that is, you know, incontrovertible. Stars welcome us as it is above, so it is below. Land is reflected in the sky. My sky and my earth, they go together. So I'm considering climate change is a really big topic and a hard one. And I find controversy difficult, honestly. So I picked something where there's very little controversy. Nobody has ever said, I like my light pollution. You can't take that away from me. So that's where I focus because it is part of the whole of this, um, the excess wasted light. You know, you've got artificial light at night and it can be reduced through awareness, through technical solutions, legislative policy. All of this can reduce our carbon footprint a lot, generating a lot less energy that we use just to light up the sky. So what is that? Um, new tech is like phosphor converted amber, 2200 Kelvin lights. Uh, there are narrow band amber street lights out there now timers, dimmers, motion sensors, smart controls, all of that stuff. And the evidence is mounting that artificial light at night is a risk 
it's a risk factor for humans. It's it's being studied, but mood disorders in teenagers, real tight connection. Obviously insomnia, but that then gets your circadian rhythms messed up, which can lead to diabetes, cancer, heart disease, obesity. So all of this chrono, chrono disruption is is bad for you. So how do we how do we fight it? Well, here's legislation woo, passed in the city of Pittsburgh um, in 2021, the dark sky ordinances. And I had a little hand in this. Uh, I'm very proud of that little hand in this. <laughs> so this says that um, streetlights and public properties, including all the institutions that sit on city property, the zoo, FIPS, National Aviary, whenever there's large scale renovations or new buildings are put up, uh, they have to be dark sky compliant. All the lights have to be dark sky compliant. So there's a company called 10, the Efficiency Network, terrible name, I know. 10, within a year, they're going to deliver a dark sky compliant design for the placement of about 4,400 high pressure sodium streetlights to LEDs. And hopefully um, the retrofit will be completed about two years after that. Um, what my goal is here is to make a map of the city. So we have a before and after map of the city. We're also working in the state. And we got all these senators, state senators to agree to a proclamation. And that um, showed that they are on board. And this is across the state and this is Across parties because it's a win-win scenario. If we put dark sky ordinances for the whole state, the little close to 2,000 municipalities that each individually decide on their street lights will have to follow state guidelines for, for the state lights that go through their little towns. So my, my goal here is to start with education, like just not light only what you need, where you need it, when you need it. It's like so basic. And I try to repeat the same thing over and over and over in the oh so many interviews. I wish all the people that were listening to the venues where I was interviewed were listening at the same time. Like all the subscribers were reading the paper and they saw that article or all the people were watching TV or seeing the documentaries or the podcasts or radio, because that would be 1.2 billion people would have heard my words in the last couple of years. This is what I want. This is the temperature chart. And this is so funny because people think, oh, well, we have 5,500 Kelvin streetlights. That's as bright. That's as hot as the sun. They're not, they're not as hot as the sun. This is just a representation of the colors. So the ones we want are kind of amber colored. They would go from these amber to these shielded ones from the left to the right, but I want them to stay amber. Shielded, so we don't see all those sparkles, but amber. And what would we, what would we gain? You know, billions every year. Think about your carbon footprint and what that would do. We are going to use energy efficient LEDs and controls that will dim them, which is great. As far as I've heard so far, um, but think of all the energy that we could we could save if we do it right. Uh, it could really change the world, starting in Pittsburgh. Because, you know, education. <laughs> Has anybody ever gone to the mattress factory? They're actually doing uh, some things with light pollution next year. I'm working with one of the artists there. It's like, you've got these bright pixel sticks on your roof. <laughs> and I feel like sometimes it's like two steps forward. And this lighting upgrade, 600,000 programmable LED lights, sister bridges. Why? Because the struts are great. I don't understand that. It's like two steps forward and 600,000 steps back. So we've been using 
drones, aircraft flying low and slow, helicopters, satellites, astronauts are taking pictures of Pittsburgh for me, which is kind of cool. This is Carnegie Mellon. One of my students found that the brightest part of the city is the Eds and Meds corridor in Oakland, where all Carlo and Chatham and Pitt and CMU are. Got to keep those kids safe, even though safety and crime are not correlated with excess light. And Phipps Conservatory, I, I give this picture to everybody, all the magazines. Um, the managing editor actually yelled at me for that. He said, how can you call us not green? We're a greenhouse. It's right in our name. <laughs> so I kept sending it. But it's, you know, it's part of the disaster we're facing is because we've lightened the night thousands of times more than it should be. And I've got science fiction writers on my side. I did two talks at the Net Two Nebulas that were here in the city about this. And I, I've been poking individuals. Maggie Stiefvater put a nice block in there, one of her latest books, and Tamara Pierce, because if you include it in your fiction, you're going to you're going to get a response from people. They're they're popular writers and they put light pollution in their work. And I'm just I'm so entranced with them. Of course it helps that, you know, I did nothing but uh, science fiction for so many decades and I was on the board of directors at CIFLA and I ran the nebulas and like I I know all the people. <laughs> So it does help at an in, but we're having declines in animal species, things that light pollution impacts. And this chart, well, way off the, I'm not going to go into this, but you can see like if it infects, if it affects the individual, you know, a mouse doesn't go out because it's too bright and they're afraid at night. Then it affects the population who eats that mouse. It affects their species and their community and the food web and the ecosystem and everything. You get one light out your back door and you're causing change and it travels. There's nothing stopping it. It scatters in the atmosphere over mountains. So you've got sky glow and then we can't see the stars. People think that I only want to talk about it because of the stars and that's not actually true. There are a lot of changes that have to take place, cultural changes that have to take place. And the story is the best way to do that, in my opinion, because you can show people these pictures, uniform lighting, kind of like a whiteout situation, not really good depth perception. What you need are these gentle overlapping ovals. You got bad lights that shine everywhere and glare gets in your eyes, which can be debilitating especially for older adults these are not great lights if you shift to the amber and you cut out the blue part of the spectrum the blue doesn't scatter around in your eyes anymore causing a lot of that disability these are lights down at point park aren't these beautiful that's the way to do it shine a light up from inside the pole and then just gently down all well diane all shielded in, Diane, All right. That was, that, um, yes. it, this is so many amazing insights and connections, um, but Susan has a hard time limit and uh, okay. so want to- This is my last, my last okay. slide. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just going to wind it down soon. This Thank is you. The, Sorry to interrupt. invite you all up to my house. <laughs> so there's my little house and my ducks. And I just, uh, Marin knows that I want to have like some kind of party up here. My deck is way bigger than my house. And so it would be nice. I would enjoy that. So thank you. Well, I can stay. I, I can. They're, they're going to record okay. it the other thing. And I want to stay for panel. Okay. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to duck... Uh, thank you so much, Diane. I guess I, I kind of thanked you a moment ago for uh, powering through COVID and uh, sharing those, you make drawing so many different connections that people just don't think about. 
in their life. And I'm, I'm looking at your picture here, but <clears throat> you can't see me. Anyway, <laughs> um, thanks so much. Uh, and we're going to now uh, turn it over to Scott, um, who uh, has just a brief introduction. He is the publisher and editor of Dreamforge, which is a magazine of speculative literature that uh, is very closely related to this question of hope and positive futures. So thanks for being here, Scott. And then we will, once Scott is done, we'll just launch into the panel and discussion. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Nice to meet you, kind of, sort of. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I just absolutely love listening to Susan and Diane there. Um, those are really great. And if you want to learn more about the stuff Susan was talking about in Dreamforge Online, which will be for free, uh, she's having an article coming out, uh, Rewriting the Future, that'll be out a little bit later in September. And uh, actually, my, my wife's here. You'll see her as a little Dreamforge sticker that, that uh, is there as well. And she's doing the layout. So she was actually working on laying out Susan's article while she was listening to Susan give a talk about stuff. So that was that was an interesting thing for her. OK, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to just give a really quick share screen and a review of what Dreamforge is, maybe for just a minute or so. And then we can go into our panel. So let me see if I can manage that technically. Hold on a second. All right. Oh, could someone enable screen sharing for me? If not, I'll just talk, but we thought we'd give it a shot. Got it. Ah, that looks like it's going to work. Let me see what I can do here. I thought I did before, but maybe you went on and off again or something. Oh, it's possible. Let me see what we can do. Um, not sure if I selected the right one, but let me know if you're seeing uh, Dreamforge, a magazine of positive science and fantasy fiction. Yeah, it looks good. We are. Okay. Um, so that's us. We've been, we're in our fifth year of publication. Um, uh, our tagline is where the human adventure is just beginning, which I stole from Star Trek, the motion picture in their ending credits. Um, this is just a look at some of our issue covers. Um, so that you can see we have, have quite a diversity in stories and fantasy and science fiction. Uh, just a little bit about us here. Uh, Dreamforge is a science and fantasy fiction magazine founded on the idea that the human adventure is just beginning. We often use the tagline, in all worlds and times, our tales revolve around those individuals and groups who bring meaning and value to the world, whose actions are of consequence, and whose dreams are the vanguard of things to come. All of our stories are illustrated. Again, that's that's my wife uh, doing most of the illustrations. And then we do have artists who work with us for illustrations from time to time when we can afford it. Uh, our, one of our, our favorite illustrators is Elizabeth Leggett, who's a Hugo Award-winning illustrator who works with us on covers and some interior illustrations. And you can see even in this, this example, in these illustrations, you're seeing some of the themes that we've talked about today just reflected visually with, you know, generations working with one another and, and uh, creating sustainable environments and things like that. Let's see. Uh, we do have an online component. That's where I was I was talking about. We're, we're going to have a new online issue coming out here just here in September. And it, we have a reader's portal where you can go in and select the issue you want and just uh, read things. Uh, we're basically supported by a Kickstarter and crowdfunding and then people who subscribe. Um, you really don't need to subscribe to read the stories, but it helps us pay for stories. So that's great. And subscriptions get you the digital issues, which we also have. So we have Mobi and EPUB issues, and those are actually only for paid subscribers. We've also done an anthology um, working with Angela Rico Smith of... Uh, um, Space and Time magazine. We did a book called, uh, an anthology called Worlds of Light and Darkness, where we provided all the hopeful stories and Space and Time provided all the dystopian stories. So it, it kind of made that nice, nice mix to catch people's attention. Uh, one of the things you'll see in Dreamforge is that we are really trying to get away from the idea of the hero as the solver of all the problems or the great man theory or whatever you might want to call it. So a lot of our illustrations you will see, you know, at least two people in because we're talking about connections and relationships. 
Um, we're not so much saying, here's the hero who just walks in and solves everything for you. It's communities who solve things and people who support one another is looking for. We have a wide diversity of authors um, in both you know areas of the world that they're from and age ranges and, and that sort of thing. We have a, a we basically want to support writers. We uh, I think it was Diane talking just a little bit ago said having you get what you get and you have trouble getting the hopeful stories that you want. So we formed a writers group called Dreamcasters. They're actually supporters of us on Patreon. And we teach them how to write better stories and we encourage them to write hopeful stories and we bring in guest speakers and that sort of thing to work with them as well. So this is just one of our slides we'd had, we had uh, last year, Mary Robinette Cowell uh, and uh, Marie Vibbert come in and talk to our writers as well. We have a meeting with them like every month, meeting with our writers every month. Okay. At Dreamforge Magazine, we welcome readers with a passion for positive fantasy and science fiction. Here you'll find stories where characters endure, overcome, and embrace that spirit of wonder and discovery through which sentient beings invest the universe with meaning and purpose. Our outlook is optimistic, faithful to those dreamers and makers who came before us to brave ages far darker than our own. I'd like to emphasize that we always we tend to think that this is a horrible age and it's apocalyptic and everything is out of control. There, you know, it, you don't have to go back farther than World War II to live in an age far darker than our own. <laughs> um, but we're supportive of present idealists who remain indomitable in the face of our times' apocalyptic fears and hopeful that the principles of compassion, justice, and truth shall endure until the end of time. That is one of my favorite covers of Dreamforge. That was done by Elizabeth Leggett. And you can find out everything you need to know about us at dreamforgemagazine.com. And there we're done. So that's us. Thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna do is put this here okay. so right. you can be comfortable and you guys can be heard. I think um, the folks on Zoom can tell us in chat whether uh, the sound is working. Mark will uh, spotlight the right people. Thank you, Mark. And um, the magazine is, of course, linked on the Marin's List description of this event. And uh, of the scoop. So uh, does anyone have any reflections on this to launch the conversation or would you like to circle back to susan if you have something i'm not sure how you want to do this um i i would i welcome questions because part of what i want to know is what do you want to to read what what do you feel inspired is, is all these things i'm saying sound hollow to you or is there something that's resonating there what what helps you get through the day I have a different question. Go for it. So you're in this, like, and, and I thought about this for all 10 seconds, so apologies. Right? Um, but you have the, you have this, this idea of getting these things out, of getting these stories out, and yet you're doing it within a system that, like you say, is, is a, you know, a commercial system. So you've resorted to self-publishing or whatever, like, and, and there's, there's incentives and disincentives built into so, so you're kind of trying to create a positive, a way to get positive futures out and propagated in a system which is itself capitalistic and all these other things. And I'm just kind of wondering how you navigate that or where you feel the friction or where it feels like it can make an impact on those those systems you have to work in. Um, that's a great question with your 10 seconds that you came up with it. Um, Marin, how do you want to do that? Are we going to do round robin answers or what do you want to do? I think you did a really great job moderating that Hope Punk panel that that is featured on her website and in which yeah. I learned a lot about Hope Punk. Okay. Um, and so I think just a free for all. Okay. What do you think? Free for how all. do you, I, uh, I'll, I'll take it. I haven't designed then... this. If somebody Particularly. else wants to kick in after I yeah. I blather on, um, I can speak personally to being frustrated. First of all, not resorting to self-publishing because uh, it's my first choice. It's uh, what I've made my career in. I have 
fans, readers. I've made a living at it. I put my kids through college with it. Like it's okay. it's a thing. Um, and I feel like you're correct on on several levels. One is that there is a traditional gatekeeper system. Um, and I mentioned this briefly in my presentation. I'm hitting that more at the novel level. Okay, at the short fiction level there's just like this crazy cauldron of creativity there's people like scott and jane who are running their zine on love and and some knowledge of web design like i mean <laughs> it's amazing how how there's people who are passionate about stories working the science fic or the short fiction so there's actually a lot of places where you can get published and they they are attracting readers so there's little pockets there. Um, and I think it's pretty traditional in the science fiction world to think of that as being a cauldron of innovation that eventually bubbles up to the novel level where ideas eventually will get published. And it, we just kind of whisper about how like there's gatekeepers and traditionalists and all that like that gets very sotto voce. Um, but it exists. And what I found personally is that sure, I might try to get, you know, random house, random penguin to publish me on my not my next novel that I write, um, but I'm probably more su likely to be successful using a small press. So small presses are sort of stepping into that gap of what large presses are unwilling to publish, but it's no less quality. And it, these small presses are putting out books that are winning awards. And, and once you win the award, you get the visibility. So like uh, Monk and Robot, one of the uh, very, very 10 out of 10 Hope Punk novel, Monk and Robot won a Hugo Award. Now, they were published by a traditional press, but still, that could have just as much come out of a small press. And I'm seeing some of that. On top of that, self-publishing is like going direct to the readers. So in a way, it's almost like a very solar punk kind of activity, right? It was like, Forget all y'all. I'm just going to go find my people and give them what they want, right? So I've, I've been spending a lot of personal time figuring out how to do that and um, creating some works. And I'm just sort of getting to the phase where it's like, okay, you know how to market these things? Like, you know, get, get your act together, get on TikTok, find the people, make it happen. And I just haven't quite gotten there yet. And I kind of feel like, that's true of a lot of the community. They don't know how to market. I happen to know how to market. So I'm like, come on, you gotta like use your skills and do something. So it's coming. Um, my, the, my, and I'm jabbering on, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> my current obsession is the screenplay that I'm working on, which is a TV pilot um, for this fellowship that I'm applying for. I've been wildly excited to discover that there are a lot of people in Hollywood pushing against those institutional barriers. And I'm I'm here to tell you if Barbie can be a one billion dollar not movie and it's like a feminist manifesto, like the subversives are at work. Okay. That's just what I'm going to say that. And the, the studio execs and the strike and all that is there's some deep, deep problems. But um there are people that have the right intention. And if you keep knocking on the door long enough, I think they will get through. One of the things that I think is really cool is doing in Hollywood right now is, and this is through the Hollywood Summit, uh, Climate Summit, is they're trying to get a little bit of climate in every story. Because every story should be a climate story. Like it's our reality that we're living in this. So if you just erase climate change from your, I don't know, detective story in New York, but there's no, you know, Sandy Hook, or not Sandy Hook, but like, no, Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, thank you. Um, you're, you're erasing reality. Now you're in a fantasy world. And okay, but we need to not do that. We need to not erase that. We need to show more sustainable living. And um, it's happening, but it's nascent. And I, yes, the tension is there, but I don't feel like it's a stumbling block because there are so many ways we're getting around it. But I would love to hear what Scott thinks about that and Diana as well, but. Um, well, you, I'll, I'll answer first. Uh, for us, for instance, we never got into this thinking, oh, we're going to have a million readers and we're going to get out there and dominate 
any marketplace or whatever. Our theory is all more the butterfly effect. So what we're trying to do is basically get the right dozen readers, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, just to give you a couple actual examples, um, uh, in issue four of Dreamforge, we published a first story by a young man who whose name is Robert Harpold. Robert Harpold, as it turns out, went on in just a few years to become a NASA engineer uh, who works on the uh, trajectory and realignment, the Targo team at, for the Artemis mission, um, you know, so... Now he he's and when when he first published with us, I said, you have a really great writing style. I know you're into science. You know, if you ever want to write a science article, uh, talk to me. That would be a great thing. So a few years later, he's talking to us and he says, well, you know, I'm on the Targo team with Artemis now. And I'd like to write a story talking about how the Artemis mission can benefit people and 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 what we're doing and how teams work together and all that sort of thing. So butterfly effect, if we encouraged this young man to become a science educator, um, then that was it. Every effort that we made, fine, we're done. We, we, we served our purpose. But we have, you know, other examples. Um, little Susan just is a great example that we've been able to give some voice to, you know, her story, um, the Joy Fund, which was a wonderful story set in Pittsburgh, which which has, you know, Hope Punk uh, feel and theme to it and her article that she's going to write for us. That's part of the butterfly effect. Um, we published a short story uh, by a young uh, man, David Hankins, who um, went on to win Writers of the Future. Um, and he's part of our Dreamcasters, and so every month we get to work with him, and and he has a lot of humor. He can bring a lot of humor and stuff to his stories. He's gonna he's gonna be somebody at some point here, and we're there shaping that idea that tell us about futures that are beyond apocalypse. And so he wrote a story for Dreamforge called the, "A Day on the Orbital Ranch," just basically bringing that idea that one day you know we will have. Uh, constructions in space so vast that there will be ranching there and that will be relieving some of the pressure off of, you know, earth, that sort of thing. And so there we have the tiny little butterfly effect. And so, you know, that's what I would say. It's like everybody can do their little part. You don't have to say, we're going to, you know, change the world with this one little thing. Go, go do one, go do something and, and start that little ripple in the pond. Um, and I'll, now today, <laughs> Susan, do you want to answer your question in the chat about the joy fund? Yeah, I oh. can't see the chat, so uh, I'll bring it up. Oh, okay. You can ask the name of the story <laughs> just mentioned, and and then it is the joy fund. Okay, Diane answered it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't think there's another question. Yeah. So go ahead, Diane. Um, oh, yes, there is. Which Dream Forge is the Joy Fund in? <laughs> ah, I, will, I will actually, while Diane talks, I will actually try to find the link to it online and put it in the, the chat. So I will, I'll work on that while Diane answers some stuff. Okay, so my take on this in 2002, I started a writing residency workshop. It's at the University of Pittsburgh Greensboro teenage writers from all over the world. We called it Alpha, the beginning. And talk about being subver subversive. <laughs> Those teens wrote so many short stories and published them in professional, um, professionally. We had two students got three book contracts from tour. I mean, they were already the best students out there. It's not like in two weeks you could teach them everything a student might have to know about becoming a good writer. They were already good writers. We gave them the discipline and the knowledge of how to sell their stories and how to critique and gave them lifetime critique partners. And they have been changing the world of science fiction. There have been so many climate change books and stories that have come out of that. It's been going. Uh, I, I ran it for 17 years and then I got busy doing these other things. And so my team is taking over with it. But if you're between 14 and 19 and you or you know someone who likes to write science fiction, fantasy or horror between those ages, give Alpha a look. It's an amazing workshop and free to anybody who can't afford it.
ask a question um, for both Susan and Diane. I noticed you both mentioned video games or uh, interactive games, and that's the, the field that I'm in. I'm a game designer. I actually work at the Entertainment Technology Center. So, um, but I, so I'm interested to hear more about your thoughts in that field. Like, uh, have you thought more about how interactive media, participatory in that way, might contribute to uh, discovering or um, exploring solutions? Um, I'll jump in because Diane probably has the real answer to that question, but I'm gonna throw my two cents in first. Um, I have a kid who is a huge gamer. And so everything I know about gaming, I learned from her. Uh, but I am delighted to see games like Stray. Um, things that are like, we're just vibing, you know, I'm a cat and I'm vibing through the apocalypse, but it's it's got that chill vibe, the Hope Punk vibe. So I think the interactive part, first of all, storytelling. Game storytelling in games has become so amazing, right? Over the last decade especially. And so I'm sure you know about this more, but I'm saying for everyone else. Um, yes, we have an opportunity there, and there's a lot of great opportunities for building and cooperative. Because, like, the way my kid uses games, right, they build an entire space station with their friends. You know, it's, it's Minecraft on the moon or, you know, things like that. And sure, there are also the ones where they're, like, doing shooting games and all that, but there's so much more and that that generation truly is games is the access point for the younger generation and, and you know even millennials have a huge number of people that game so i would love to see more i've got i've got little nibbles of ideas of that i've seen but you can tell me i think probably better where where solar punk and, and hope punk is showing up in those games and probably diane can with her new vr climate thing with the animal my goodness <laughs> at about this time last year we had a demonstration here at a salon by a local developer of cooperative games it was very complicated <laughs> some games are like that <laughs> could you share your name with me hi nice to meet you my name's heather kelly and we'll be in touch because i'm actually the faculty on the project that you're going to be working on this semester so <laughs> i didn't realize that until you said it I'm like oh yeah I'm <laughs> but we'll be in touch Amazing. oh how funny that's really cute um yeah like susan i learned everything i know about gaming from my kids uh one of them uh, got uh, YC Combinator funding last year to start a company called Iliad.ai, which is generative art for gamers specifically. And it's got a lot of newfangled bells and whistles on it that nobody's at doing out there. Um, so I'm kind of happy. YC Combinator is a accelerator that started things like Dropbox, Eventbrite, DoorDash, um, you, <laughs> you, Stripe, you, you probably have heard of 90% of their companies. They're just fantastic. And they taught them how to, how to raise money and funds after that. But it, it's incredible to me that that is a very powerful tool because you are, you are right there. It, when we were writing, we talk about a little birdie sitting on your shoulder, chirping in your ear. Like get close, get that close so that you're you are that hearing that little birdie chirping. And with the VR setting, you're just there. You're just there. <laughs> so there's no closer you can get. Um, so I imagine it's gonna really pick up to be a powerful tool. Are you seeing solar punk games pop up? <clears throat> yep. There was a, a group of students last uh not this last semester, but for the one before that created a, a solar punk uh, game that's set in um, recent time, 15 years in the future, and then 30 years. And you see how a, a found family actually um, sort of adapts and, and co co cooperates and collaborates to make changes. So I will send you a link to that. Please do. Yeah. I will add it to my collection on my website of recommended Film, TV, games, mm -hmm. books, of course. Um, yeah, I think Gen Z is revolutionary. I have Gen Z kids, 
and I look at them and I'm like, okay, well, I wasn't like that when I was a kid. <laughs> and um, more objectively, I think they are the first generation that has already adapted to climate change as a reality in their world. And so you see that reflected in many different aspects of how they approach them. You also see it reflected in their anxiety and their depression, their suicide rates. You know, so we need to help these kids survive, but they are also figuring out already how to survive. They have their friend groups, they have their found families already. Like that's how they survive. So um, we can take a lot of lessons from them. So I'm always very curious of like, of course they are. Of course Gen Z is making a solar punk game. That's a completely consistent thing. So thank you. I have a question I'm not sure how to ask. Uh, I'm, I'm not a writer, but I aspire to write. And um, sure. if you can use your outside voice, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know how to ask this question, but is there something about climate fiction or uh, folk punk uh, in at a high level? It's different than other genres of literature when you approach it as a writer. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if I can take a quick shot at that, I'd just like to tell you what I'd like to see. Um, what we like to see as far as hope punk, solar punk, climate fiction is basically, um, again, veer away from the idea of a hero who comes in and solves the problem. What we want to see is a team or a community um, working together to solve a problem. Um, but other than that, fiction has its basic three act structure and you're basically trying to overcome a problem and you have a try fail cycle. And so there are basic story elements that are the same for every story. But as far as the overarching structure, what we want to see is, um, you know, show us people solving things, show us people working toward better solutions instead of, and the zombies came and they ate everybody. You know, uh, so so the, <laughs> it, as a matter of fact, we have a wonderful zombie story. Vern Frank returns to our neighborhood, which is about the things I just said. It's about how does how does the community respond to zombies, almost like they would respond to helping homeless people. Um, you know, so so that's the the kind of thing that we're looking for. It's just avoid the the great man solves the problem theory, and and uh, you know, show us more than that, and show us moving beyond the problem. Mm -hmm. I would also add just real quick and then I'll um, if you check out my website and look at the slides I have some links on there especially to the heroine's journey super recommend that book because it talks about structural storytelling um, but also the challenge that I have and you know anyone who's been on the planet for a long while and has read stuff you have a stored bank of stories that are not these kinds of cooperative, compassionate storylines. So you kind of have to fight through that wall. You know, you're going to have some intuitive, oh, the story should be like this. And you have to more consciously work into story elements. And it might be struggle, but you know what? All writing is struggle. So if that's what you're you're venturing down, I just want to tell you all, all writing is struggle. It's going to be struggle. <laughs> just keep going. Keep writing and keep going and you will get there. So when you're writing hopeful things relating to climate change, is it better to put the climate change in the foreground or the background? I mean, is it, is, you know, are you writing a story about zombies in Pittsburgh with climate change going on as a, as a sort of background that everyone understands? Or are you specifically writing a story about climate change in Pittsburgh? Oh. And zombies in the background. Just, <laughs> zombies in the background, yeah. which would be amazing. <laughs> Um, Which would be very Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, or somewhere in the greater world. I, I think, first of all, we need a thousand stories with climate in there somewhere. So, yes, all of that, please. Um, secondly, I would say the, the core question for me personally that I try to bring out in my stories is I'm an individual in this world where climate is changing. What do I do? How do I cope? 
what is how do I, the individual, connect to the institutions of power and change to make a difference? It feels I feel so small. Like how can I possibly affect anything? And so through my storytelling, I try to show how individuals can do that, how they can interface with structures of power, how they can advocate for people who are not in power, how they can change the system of power. And so I think you we need more stories that center that experience because that's the experience we're all having. And we need a thousand stories that tell the different ways to, to manage that. And maybe zombies too. But I'd love to hear Diane's thoughts about that. Um, I just I just wanted to say, if you are writing and you want to join us, we have a free critique group here in Pittsburgh for science fiction, fantasy stories, and some horror. And they, they meet at the uh, Mount Lebanon Library, I think, every other week. And then uh, the alternate Tuesdays, it's on Zoom. So you don't have to go to the library, but super nice group. We started it in 1996 and it's still going strong, if that's any uh, good record. <laughs> so um, if you get that far and you want to write something, or even you just want to come and listen to people talking about writing, you're more than welcome. I just wanted to give a quick example of how you can approach like a climate story without being necessarily preachy or just focusing on the disaster of climate change. One of my favorite stories from Dreamforge is called Sapiens, and it was written by David Manna, who's uh, an Italian who's actually a climatologist. And his story focuses on a time traveler who comes back to our age Basically, his job is to figure out why were why were we in this age so in such despair about things about climate change? Because and there's one point where he's not really supposed to interact with the, the locals. He's just trying to figure out well, what is this zeitgeist, this psychology where humanity almost gave up because of this problem they were facing? And he's just in doesn't understand it, and he's basically saying well, don't you understand? You're a member of Homo sapiens. We have a big brain and music and art. And of course we were going to solve this. Um, so that's how the story approaches it from the point of view of a time traveler who's, who's only coming back to see why we were in such despair and didn't realize that of course we were going to solve this problem. You know, and it, it just had that that hope based in that idea. That's great. I love that. Yeah? I got a question. I am curious to know your reflections across the whole group about how the pandemic has intersected with the hope punk genre. Because it's been a cataclysmic kind of societal thing. How have those things touched each other? Well, the term hope punk was invented in 2017. Um, and then it kind of stalled a little bit. And I think it's sort of gained a little more esteem since the pandemic. Pandemic gifted us with a pause where we stopped polluting dramatically for a short period of time and some kind of almost miraculous things happened where you know wildlife came back and and it it gave us a beat to think and i think we are still finding out what what happened in that beat and one of those things is people saying, you know what, I've just been running, 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 and I don't want to be on the treadmill anymore, and I want to, like, make a difference. And one of the things that climate change gives us, gifts us, I believe, is, is purpose. Like, if you wanted to have a life of meaning, deep meaning, and opportunity to make a difference in the world, you could not do better than be alive in this time. Because there's so much to fix. Right? There is so much opportunity to do something meaningful, but it is so, we don't always remember that because it is so hard to be in that time. Hard to live through interesting times. It's grueling. It beats us down. And the pandemic, I think, gave us a moment. Not everybody. Some people were like, the pandemic obviously made things very stressful, right, for everyone. But it was also this weird global experience where everyone experienced that stress at the same time. And so there's a glimmer of that connection that we need to have in order to solve this. Of course, things didn't stay connected, but I think it, I think it gave us an opportunity to 
understand that we could turn on a dime if we had to. We absolutely had to. And so now here we are. This is our chance to do something. Thank you. What do you guys think? Uh, if I go second, I'll, I'll say a, a little bit like a shock to the system, like as a person, when you're like almost in a car accident or you almost have some disease or whatever, but then you get well and it's like you have that moment to reevaluate, gee, was I really, should I really have been working the hundred hours at the job? Was that really meaningful for my life? What do I want to do that's that's a little better than that? So so I kind of look at it like that. It just gave that the whole world that experience kind of all at once. What are we what are we doing? Sorry, I totally missed the question because my dog had to go out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure they covered it completely. <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, do you have any other questions? Or I don't know where Meredith went. I have sort of two. Okay. Um, and there, there may be just discussion items more than questions, but I'm thinking about like how, how this, this kind of stuff ties in with how people's brains are wired and that like humans tend to be more geared towards avoiding losses than um, you know, looking for the next great thing, um, in some, you know, to some extent, and, um, and also, like, a um, video game, like, Zelda, or something, uh, playing that with my kids made me think about how the, the setting of the game might have a lot to do with, like, how much people like it, because it's, like, out in nature, and, get to run around and stuff like that so that's that's the the brain thing and then also um i wanted to say i thought i was coming here for myself but um i also have a daughter who is finishing up a degree in writing for film and virgin media and it was great to find out we're talking about video games which is what she likes to do too Discussion. <laughs> um, I'll I'll go again. I seem to do that. Uh, I think we're still figuring out a lot about how human brains work. And gosh, I wish we didn't have to learn the hard way that some people just were simply not get vaccinated in a worldwide pandemic. And gosh, I wish we didn't have to understand how appealing fascism is to some. All right, so. I think we're learning a lot um, and we're having to evolve quickly to catch up with all of our technology that we've done to ourselves, right? We're in this kind of race of, can we become wise and, and figure out enough? <laughs> sure, we have all these great flaws <laughs> as humans. We also have a very, and I believe this very fundamentally, we are built to connect to other people. We are built to connect to nature. We have some, if we were not a, a social species where we literally will die if we do not have love as children, we literally have to have that to survive. If we didn't have that baked in, we wouldn't have gotten as far as we did structurally, like just building societies that work together. Like we work together every day in a thousand different ways to just exist. It's almost a caricature of how you know disabling capitalism can be that it stops us from connecting and i think as we get lonelier and as we get more separated we are rediscovering the pandemic did this for us as well that we need connection zoom is not enough we need to go out in the woods and we need it at like a core level like i literally am going to lose my mind if I have to do one more Zoom call or if I can't like see the tree. And so we're stumbling our way through it, but I do feel like because I see a thousand people in a thousand different situations saying, this is important. This is, I want a different way to be, a better way to be because I only have one life and I, I'm not gonna spend it commuting to work every day. You know, like two hours in my car, I'm not going to do it anymore. And so, yeah, I think we are learning. And I think people like your daughter 
are going to help us build environments that she's, she'll, she's going to go build the thing that she wants, right? This is hopefully, I hope. I hope you will tell her, build what you want to see in the world. Make that happen. And I guarantee you, you will find a million other people that want that too and that are hungry for that connection. All right, y'all. I was going to say human brains are terrible limiters in, in all this. We've evolved to look for the lion in the grass that's about to eat us, um, you know, and our social society and our, our um, technologically social media society has has basically glommed onto that and, and built all its algorithms around that. So all the things that are going on good in the world with, you know, poverty being reduced in the last century, child mortality being as low as it's ever been um literacy higher than it's ever what do i care about all that why you know i'm i'm worried about you know this the this horrible thing you just told me about because that's what's going to click in my brain and then you can go down the rabbit hole of just reading horrible thing after horrible thing after horrible thing where if you went in the other direction you could also read about lots of good things that are that are happening and that are that are countering that so so i think our just the way we're evolutionarily built is both a limitation on us moving forward in some ways and um it's also something that a lot of our technology is geared to basically focus on the the essentially the bad things or the negative things and and one last little point with that is we also tend to raise the bar of our expectations every time we do something so no matter what we do no matter how it improves things or whatever the next thing out of our mouths is we could have done better than that why aren't we here you know so so and that tends to reinforce a, a negative sort of thing so so yeah you, that's just a struggle it's always going to be a struggle because our physical form hasn't changed in like a hundred thousand years and it's probably not going to change real soon <laughs> that that was perfectly perfectly said we have a limited pool of worry and it can't hold everything and climate change creeps up slowly and so it's generally not in that pool of worry that's like, what am I eating tonight? And where is my next paycheck coming from? And are my kids going to be okay out on the street at this hour? And so you, you, we're built that way. That's what we do. Um, also, there's the point where if your social circle doesn't agree with your point of view, you get booted. <laughs> so if you agree, grew up with this group of high school students or some group where their philosophies don't agree with yours anymore. There are a lot of people who will just not say anything and go along with the crowd and because they want to keep their friends. Social things are so powerful. So we're, we're in a situation where you're right, the limitations of our own brains are, are, a lot of times holding us back. This fall, I'm teaching a class at CMU that's a wellness class. I've taught it the last few years for freshmen. And you know, I get my mom coat on and it's like, did you call your parents? Have you eaten? Did you sleep right? Are you, here's how to study. You know, like have some friends talk to you, or you go outside, like it's, it's really simplistic and it's so necessary for those freshmen coming in because they've been grind, 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 grind to get there. And then they're there and they don't know what to do. <laughs> so it's a it's an experience and I, it, every fall, I see it over and over, people finally becoming adults. And it's really cool. Well, I wanna answer you, ask just a moment. <laughs> I want to circle back on what Diane just said and connect it back to Hope Hub. Because the more that we portray in fiction on the screen and in our book, people being kind to each other, having time to heal, allowing room for difference, all those positive things, mm -hmm. teaching wellness. Say, look, here's some basic things. Have you eaten? Have you slept? You know, like maybe you're angry because you're hangry. You're not like actually angry at the world. Maybe you can cope a lot better if you've had some sleep. Basic, that's radical and disruptive, okay? To, in a world what, that wants you to run until you die and produce and consume until you die. And no, there's a lot of people who are just saying no. 
And the more that we can reaffirm that through classes and fiction is my, is my wheelhouse. That's what I'm going to do. I really genuinely feel people are hungry for that. They'll look for it in their games. They'll look for it on their TV screen. Yeah. I just wanted to <clears throat> make a comment about this last discussion about human nature. And uh, it seems like most people don't have the capacity to sacrifice anything to solve this problem, like with climate change. Like there's all these stories about, for example, in New Jersey, there's a town where they're building a big wind farm 15 miles offshore. And there's gonna be these little pick, toothpick sized things in the, in the horizon. And, and they're really angry and they're protesting. They're trying to get this eliminated, but they're not realizing this energy has to come from somewhere. Yeah. And they're, they're unwilling, it's a, it's a NIMBY thing. They're just, oh, can't do it, no. And, and that's just one example. Also things like eating meat. People like to eat meat. How are we gonna tell people, well, that's a massive climate, uh, you know, a, a carbon footprint for eating meat, mm -hmm. it's huge. Mm -hmm. But are they really gonna not eat meat? I mean, are, are, are the, is the average person really willing to give that up for, for, the, for the planet? I don't know, I, but I, I don't, I'm not optimistic. I, I feel like- I can hear your lack of optimism. Especially in a democracy, <laughs> especially in a democracy where you can't just tell everybody you're not eating meat anymore, we're done with that. Right. Uh, because it's gonna destroy the planet. Well, they'll be, you'll get voted out of office and they'll go back to, right? So it, it's a real paradox in a democracy, how you yes. deal with this. And I, I, I haven't really heard any good answer from anybody yet. Well, how that's going to play out. Well, let me give you a shot. Right. Uh, okay, sorry, Susan, go Scott, ahead. You go ahead, Scott, because I'll, I'll wind oh, up. I was, I was going to, okay, I, I, I was going to be smart ass and say impossible burgers are really good. <laughs> but um, one of the things that, that I have to keep in mind, and, and I try to have our writers explore, it, and you just said, well, in a democracy, what do you realize that everybody's some, your utopia may be somebody else's dystopia, and everybody has to be sensitive to that. And also the idea of, yes, a democracy, it's like, if you're, if you're on the side of the angels, you can't be so on the side of the angels that you become the authoritarian thing that's oppressing the other people, you know, with your ideas. So, so, you know, it, it, it is a balance and it is a, a contest of ideas. It's like, if you have the better solutions, if you can make, you know, people understand things, then that's part of the job is to have the better argument, not to, not to basically say, and everybody who eats meat, you're not allowed to anymore. So my answer would be, um, I very much understand your frustration and the idea that there's there's this disconnect. There's like, well, I think this is the solution. And I'm just sure that most people are not going to sign up for that. So, so how do we make that work? How do I can't see to the future how that works? So my first answer to that is no, you can't see the future. And neither can I. Because you can't see the path, that is not a reason to stop. And I know it's much easier when you can see the path. We have to persevere without knowing how it's going to work out specifically, the specifics. It might be that cell meat takes off and actually tastes better somehow miraculously than the kind that's raised under barbaric conditions with the terrible carbon gods. That might happen. It might be that those people die and their kids grow up and they're like, yeah, grandpa was like, a carnivore like you wouldn't believe and they would just tell the tales and but those people are gone and a lot of times social change does happen by generation now we're in a crunch all right because we don't have a lot of time to get some change going because things are going to get much worse every day that we're not making it better the democracy we can't do without that we cannot do without justice we cannot do without care and concern for people because those are foundational to the solution. Even if I can't tell you the exact technical solution or how I'm going to persuade this 30% of the people, it's already a miracle to me that 70% are already on my side. That was not true, even a few years ago. Even a few years ago, that has changed. Why? Because reality knocked on the door 
And sometimes humanity just doesn't fucking change, excuse me, doesn't fucking change <laughs> until their back is up against the wall. And then we get super inventive <laughs> and sometimes have really terrible ideas, but also some good ones. And I have faith in that survival need that we have. I have faith in the fact that we desperately want to love people and we desperately want to con connect with people. And I'm not going to give up on the future. It's worth fighting for. So I will keep at it and doing the piece that I can do and trying to tell folks, I don't know what your piece is, but you do. You work within your local world, your, your friends, your job, your, you know, all the things that are your passion. If you work within that circle, and everyone here works within their circle, we will have a difference. We will be the butterfly. We will be like a flock of butterflies. I mean, we are going to have an impact. It may not be the solution, but you know what? It's We're not gonna have the solution. We're always gonna have that complexity where terrible things are coexisting besides the things that are ultimately gonna make the world better. I hope that that helps. <laughs> if it doesn't, I have a whole bunch of fiction on my site <laughs> that mm. might make you feel better. Um, but mm. keep wrestling with that because we got to wrestle with that question. Just don't give up. And if people move away from beef, they're halfway there. There you go. From beef? Beef is so much worse than everything else. Uh -huh. Partial solution. I like it. And you can I think... you have to entirely give it up on the way to giving it up. You can dramatically reduce your meat consumption and you're, you know, you're 98% of the way there. And if everybody in the world reduced their meat consumption by 98%, it's 2% away from giving it up without having to actually give it up. And then you can get the good lab meat. Sorry, Diane, did I have a, or who had a comment? Diane. Well, I just was going to say, I think we reached a tipping point in Pittsburgh recently about veganism. There's so many vegan restaurants now and vegan options on every menu. That is not the way it is in lots of places in the world, but you get to a certain point and then everybody sees how beneficial it is. And we just reached the tipping point and I'm so proud of Pittsburgh in that. It's too easy to make food taste amazing with meat. You know you're in the hands of a really amazing chef if they built an entire restaurant without the meat. It's just the cheap, cheap way out of a good taste. <laughs> Well, I haven't found I, with what um, Diane? Diane just said. I haven't found that Go typical to... restaurant will have one out of twenty options. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, maybe I'm going to the wrong places. Probably am. But <laughs> go to Veg Fest. I went to Veg Fest recently. I don't know if you all have been there. And there's apparently a site in which I can't quote off the top of my head, but it's a local Pittsburgh site that is lists all the vegan restaurants. And they actually go through and like, you know, give the little V tag to the things that are on there. So you can, if you're looking for it, go to the website and find where your people are. Vegfest.com. Vegfest was the festival. And oh. then the website was like veganrestaurants.com or something okay. like that. I'm sorry. I don't have it off the top of my head. <laughs> so um, the idea of the problem of democracy and individualism, right? I guess what I was wondering is, has there been any kind of push to inco incorporate the ideas of sociocracy into hope or solar punk? I think Being that you're talking about solutions that involve like new strategies for people making decisions with a community. All right, so I'm gonna need you to, to give me a little more about sociocracy, yeah. and what you mean by that. So uh, it's a, it's, one of the concepts out there that people are developing to replace democracy, which involves group decision making in which everybody has the opportunity to veto, but a consensus has to be reached. And um, it's it's a lot more complicated than I'm giving it, you know, a description for. But essentially, there are um, when you have a problem, it's designed by engineers. But when you have a problem, you essentially have subgroups in which you create like. Um, rotating position to talk about the solution to the problem that then gets rolled up to the main group that has you know, decided there is an issue in the first place. It's a, it's a very like structured way for group decision making that involves all opinions 
and consensus. I'll add one more thing about it because I'm I'm really yeah. into sociocracy, <laughs> um, and that is it's also iterative. Yeah. It's designed so that you can uh, come to a consensus of a thing to do in the short term, and then just try it and see if it works. And if it works, keep it. And if it doesn't, revisit. So it's really built in this to be iterative in this very helpful way. All right. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say I'm an engineer, and I automatically distrust anything that an engineer would construct <laughs> that would replace democracy. <laughs> just uh, flat, I will just say that. Um, technocratic solutions, distrust them highly. Um, there are totally, a lot of great ideas for totally well the voting system we have. There's insane things that are good. <laughs> yes. Electoral college, yeah. the, the, the single vote system, the you know, plurality system, these are horrible. Yes. Compared so, to we, we undoubtedly have a broken democracy. So I have no argument there whatsoever. And I can list a, a bunch of things along with the Electoral College that is definitely broken. And I, and I want to see our democracy fixed to be closer to what you're you're striving for. I think what it, what I'm hearing is something that I think works at a, a smaller community it's, it's level. Not, yeah. It's, so it's a governance system. Yeah. It's not intended for nations. It's intended for organizations. And I love the fact that you can absolutely do that in our our nation as comprised, you could set up in a small community your own, you don't have to have a municipal town council, you can have sociocracy if you would like and do it as, you know, a cauldron of innovation sort of thing. Absolutely. And for whether it connects to solar punk and hope punk, I would say yes, absolutely. There's a there's a huge anarchist uh, undercurrent to a lot of solar punk. I'm not an anarchist myself, but I recognize what they're getting at with that. Um, it's a rebellion, a rejection of the fact that our democracy doesn't work. And I'm I'm more of a traditional, yay democracy, go vote. I ran for office, okay? Like I was part of the system. <laughs> I saw it from the inside about how you've got some amazing public servants who are super idealistic and trying to serve their country. And then you've got like the absolute worst of the worst in there doing terrible things. So our founding fathers, which are not people I ever quote, um, they knew that there were good and bad people back then too, right? So we need to repair what we have. And I'm open to things like sociocracy or even with anarchy philosophy have to contribute to that as long as we're actually protecting people's rights. We're actually having representative uh, representation, okay? Those are the key things because I think ultimately, even if we're stupid, even if we really like our meat or whatever our flaws are, like collectively, I feel like we're not going to, you know, but if we really had representative voting, we were not going to vote for things. A lot of the most terrible things that are happening in the country are not popular. People don't like them, but they're enacted because their democracy is broken. So, but there's a whole other side to this, which is the fact that there's so much money pushing the system and the money talks. Absolutely. That's, That's one of the broken parts. Tremendous broken problem with um, the system. Absolutely. So, sorry, my political rant there, but it's a great question. There's and actually a relevant to that locally. Come down here. Um, in with, with very very current events, which are that um, the county is hopefully on the verge of doing a climate action plan, which the city did several years ago and the county has not yet done. And um, the sustainability committee of the county council last week had a meeting, uh, a hearing. Well, it was a meeting to vote on whether to recommend doing a climate action plan to the full council. And into this meeting comes a representative of the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission, which is a, a body that channels federal funds that are used in Allegheny County and or in the 10 county region, sorry. And um, when you said that, I was thinking of the electoral college and I don't know who's mentioned because I've been in and out dealing with food and stuff. 
But the Electoral College is a way in which democracy is broken. It was developed to maintain power in slaveholding states. And um, so it, you know, its whole roots are slavery, uh, objective bad. So uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission waltz into this meeting saying, oh, you Allegheny County, you don't have to worry about this. Um, we'll take care of it. Now the SPC, as it's known, um, is made up of two representatives for each of the 10 counties and two representatives for Pittsburgh. So that means Pittsburgh has, four, you know, Allegheny County has four representatives, but the committee as a whole is totally dominated by the rural counties. So when the federal feds send money that should be used for, say, um, public transportation, the SBC puts it in high rural highways and rural interchanges. And this has happened over and over again. They just resurrected the Mon Valley Expressway, which is a terrible idea in the 70s and was dead for a long time, but it just got resurrected last year. And so this is an example. It's like, it's not the majority of people and yet it's what holds sway. So I just want to jump in with some furniture. There is a hearing and vote on Tuesday at five in the county, uh, the gold room of the county courthouse building. Um, come pack the room to the rafters. If you sign up by Monday, you can speak for three minutes. All that information is on Marin's list. There. Thank you. It's awesome. And just show up. Like it's amazing Even what you, you can do up. if you just show up. I was just reminiscing the other day that I basically led a political revolution in my hometown by literally just showing up at my school board meeting, which was totally uh, dysfunctional. And I just sat there and I just wrote down what they said. And I published it. And I came back the next week and I wrote down what they said and I published it because they did it all behind closed doors. They didn't have any audio or video. And oh my God, they were pissed. And it spurred a whole wave of change where now they have video, now they have audio because they don't want to be misquoted. And uh, then I ran for office and took seats and then like got other people on there, you know, but it was all, it all started with just showing up there, and people underestimated the power of just participating in the democracy that we even have as broken as it is. Right. I love that because I, uh... I started showing up and filming the Allegheny County Health Department meeting because they're just the shenanigans. So I just filmed and filmed and filmed, and that's partly what led to myself. I'm curious to hear all three of your perspectives on whether you need to like step into and face and deeply understand all the horribleness before you can write meaningfully about the optimism and the way through it. Are they intrinsically connected, or can you write folk punk material without having first faced all the horribleness deeply and like processed it? I do, I am not looking for an answer. I'm looking for your answer, not to for you to say right or wrong answer. I'm just here. I want to really know your opinion about that. I want to hear. Tired of looking at the shit. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Dan, why don't you and Scott go first since I've been hogging the mic and I'll talk. I think Scott is the person to answer that because you've seen people who don't have a good feel and they try to write a story anyway. How does that work out? <laughs> My answer was going to be, I, I guess the thing that concerned me about your question was that idea of deeply and horribly. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's necessary for, for any, you, you know, What's necessary for any writer is to basically have experience in the world, to just be experienced, to to talk to people, to to have, you know, have gone out and experienced life and, and that sort of thing. That's what you need. It's like it's like, no, you, you don't have to, um, uh, you know, if you were if you're going to write crime fiction or whatever, you, you really don't have to uh, delve deeply into the horribleness of of how these mass murderers tortured people and you know it no that you're just you're just like screwing with your mind when you do like the deeply and horribly part was the only part that i 
that I have have an issue with. But everybody needs life experience to be able to to write something useful. And if if you don't even have a basic understanding of something or you haven't researched something, like if you're writing something on some particular thing about climate change and maybe how fusion is going to save the world, I don't know, but you you should go learn about like what is real fusion and what are the real possibilities and and you know what might work or might not work, you know that sort of thing, rather than just make up techno babble. I guess would be the way I would say it. So yeah, go go learn about the thing you're concerned about that you're going to write about but deeply horribly yeah, i don't know that sounds a little extreme <laughs> what do you very, think Diane? that's very nicely said yeah everybody has experience about something children have experience about something so um when you say having gone through and experienced the world i'm sure you weren't talking about you have to be 45 before you can write you're just saying yeah you know some experience about what it is you're writing about uh, yeah i'm i'm was that mark asking that question yeah yes it was okay it's a good hmm. question susan <laughs> all right so i will answer personally and then i'm going to disagree with what diane and scott both just said <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. that's what i want to do okay so personally i have to protect my mental health I, um, as we talked about before, I've experienced a lot of grief um, in some of the recent years on top of the pandemic and every the, the collective grief, right? I have my own personal things and I need to protect my mental health and process and in whichever way I can. I read an extraordinary amount of climate news every day, um, but I also read Grist, which has positive you know, these are the solutions and good things. So um, I think that's important to have balance, um, protect yourself. I do that so that I can do the work that I do. I literally cannot do hope punk if I am under the deluge and depressed because I'm just not in the right framework, uh, mental framework. Um, so the way I'm gonna push back on what Scott and Diane said, <laughs> And I, I hope they will forgive me. Um, yes, we should be grounded in reality. Um, I think, especially when you're writing hopeful narratives, you kind of need to have this balancing, this counterbalance of like, make it realistic so that people will believe the hopeful part because that's like ridiculously unbelievable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a little nudge to want to be realistic to counter that. And I think that's valid and it's certainly a good approach. I also think it's a great approach to be fantastical and imagine things. Some of the best solar punk stories I've read have had absolutely no relationship to the real world. It's like a man who is a tree on an island and he's growing fruit and the birds come and nest in his tree and he feeds them with his body. And is sad when the storm comes and all the birds leave. And like, there's such poetry and emotion in that. We need those stories too. We need people, we need our poets. We need our storytellers to grab us by the heart and tell us in a visceral sense that there's hope, even if they can't see the A, B, C, D, E pathway to making it happen. We also need the Kim Stanley Robinsons of the world who are going to tell you in excruciating detail how you can drill through the polar, you know, uh, ice sheet to the bottom and liquefy the water on the bottom. And that's what's making it slide extra fast. So now we got to freeze it and that'll slow down the glaciers from like, I'm like, damn, Stan, where'd you read that? That's like, hella cool and go science <laughs> you know and then he's like yeah and then I found out that they had already done it I thought I invented something and no they had already like tried it it didn't work <laughs> and it's like well, okay but that that granularity and specificity captures our imagination right like I told you that thing and you can kind of imagine like oh that's a now my mind is opened up a little bit as to what the possibilities are so 
yes, you need to have some reality and some experience in the world, but feel free to be fantastical with your work as well. Thank you, all three of you, for your answers. I hope that Scott and Diane don't hate me now. <laughs> no, I, I I agree with everything you just said, and I don't I don't necessarily think you disagreed with us at all. So, you just you just you just added to it. Okay. Very good. All right. I don't know where we're where Marin is. Yeah, Marin is around. I know we were gonna do so. It, this is my yeah, book. Yeah. Why don't we do way. that? Why don't we do that, Marin? Can we do that? Yes. What? Can we do that thing? Yeah. The, the book thing. Yeah. 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 So last month, yeah. we had author Christina Marusic. I should have brought down her book to hold it up. Excellent book on finding the, uh, rooting out the causes of cancer and dealing with them instead of just the, uh, which is environmental exposures, rather than just seeking the cure. And uh, Christina, well, the publisher sent some books that I could rattle off. And I used uh, my kid Innes's giant ceramic dice to do the raffle. And, um, uh, but this time, uh, and and Susan kindly brought some of the excellent book, which I just read. I'm um, so like nervous that you read my book. No, I did. Well, I need to get the other one, the next one. Because now I need to know what happens. It's a quadrology. All right. All right. And, but this time, um, Susan had, uh, made little slips so we didn't have slips for the other ones i raffled off three books and and so innis produced a different thing and this is gary g-a-r-r-i um a very nice little pumpkin who looks kind of stern and you you have your little slips i don't have my slips uh -oh. if we were going to roll a dice miscommunication oh okay are they like but, but everybody needs to know so about gary so that gary, is your older brother is larry <laughs> i i could fetch him out that's l-a-r-r-i um it's a little more orange and not quite so stern um i think so rolling the dice is good and rolling then, the dice is good because okay. you get a number and then you pick it off your registration right, right? but that's more com much more complicated than your little flips well, but everybody has to fill out a slip. Which oh, they have okay. Not then that's not more complicated. You okay. can just ask everybody to freeze where they are, and then roll the dice, and then just count. Well, I do have the list. Yeah, you do. It's just not everybody's still here, but the people I who are still here. The list. You're on the list, but people who register oh. in advance get an extra shot. Oh. <laughs> that's how I did it last time. Okay. And I had a big cardboard box, but this is a much more elegant version because something saves to roll it in. That's okay. You just roll it in there as long as it's you know. okay. All right. Am I rolling? Um, I have to figure out how many people are here. So one, one, two. two. So Three. these aren't your numbers. These are just me <laughs> counting. <Yeah>. So <laughs> shush, shush, shush. <laughs> very complicated. I know. There's only three up here. Actually, we could do it by coming off, and you know your numbers. No. Okay. Yes. Four, no. Okay. One. One. Two. Remember your number. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve. Anybody else? Nearly entering? No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So it's twelve, right? So we have twelve. Now Innes has only made these dice in the D twenty. <laughs> so anything over 12, well, no, we're going to give an extra, it's also almost certain an extra to the people. I want to encourage people to it's register in advance and help wait for it. So, no, we have no idea. I don't know. It's not a democracy. Yeah. It's Marion. What? Yeah, yeah. I, that just does add complication. Okay, so you only know your number. We'll just ignore numbers above 12. Five. Someone down here. Hey! Oh, okay. All right. Okay. You already got get a me, book. So. Do we get an wow. extra number if we nice. pre register? <laughs> it adds a lot of complication. Oh, okay. I decided because then I, but you know what yeah. I didn't do? You got an extra um, number so in Aaron's heart. Just you <laughs> can't get an extra number in Aaron's heart. An appreciation for registering in the Can I get the next 20, please? So roll a different dice next time. Roll okay, different, different dice. dice. Yeah. Different die. This one is sort of speckly lavender and blue. No, that was five again. 
Nine. Yeah. Hey. 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 Okay. Another die. Because you brought so many books, we're gonna go through more dice. I do have there are more smaller dice up there. Okay. Nineteen. Oh well. <laughs> Hey! Hey! There you go. Sorry, Zoom people. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to come. <clears throat> Otherwise, it gets really too complicated. Uh, eight. <laughs> That's actually me, though. Hey! <laughs> oh, so nine was somebody else, actually. Okay. And one more? Is there another one? Yeah. A whole nother book. Very good. So don't don't look at the look at the dot dice. You can't look at it because you're only twisting it like one notch over when you roll it. When you roll it, <laughs> close your eyes. I don't want to break Innocent's eyes. I'll just look at you. Okay. So I know okay. that where my hands I trust are. You. I trust you. Nine again. Sorry. <laughs> Four. Hey. Hey. Oh, thank you. So we have a new tradition of the summer author series that includes a raffle, which is sort of raises the ante for next year. <laughs> Very exciting. Anyway, and now you've met some of the ceramic creatures, um, and there are a little box, or a little a little zine. Yeah, if if you haven't gotten this, this is just a postcard that has my website on it. Uh, but the zine is pretty fun. It has a drabble. Drabble is a story of precisely 100 words, and it's a little taste of solar fun. So if you want to see what it looks like, this is a little taste. So please help yourselves. Yes, excellent. Okay, is that is that a wrap or are, we, are you guys? I, I guess we are. Yes, I was inside doing food, but there's food ready. Okay, well I'm gonna go. We're ready here. I wanted to stay for bring this you part. a bowl of pesto. No, I I'm fine. Okay, but thank you. Yeah. I imagine your pesto is amazing. With fresh tomato. Yeah. Frozen pesto that I added cheese to today, or no cheese, and fresh tomato. Next time I will partake. All right. So, uh, so is that a wrap? I think so. Thank you, okay. people, for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in person and on Zoom. And thank you, Diane and Scott and Jane in the background for your with your amazing art. Um for coming and speaking and discussing. And thank you, especially Susan, for been being here and uh, leading us off and giving us many things to think about. My pleasure. And thank you to Mark for helping with the tech in the background. I'm sorry that that was start in part because this part is sunny until about four o'clock. <laughs> and um, I came up with an idea next time. Let's bring a white sheet. Thank you, Scott, for coming. I appreciate um, it. was nice seeing you, too. And uh, thank you to Neil in the background, helping out with things thank like Thank you for what? inviting me. It was on mute. What? You're in the background. Well, you were in the background. Anyway, helping with various things in the background, including but not limited to walking peaches. All right. So, so thank you all. Word.